We have one more wonderful lecturer for you, uh, Erica Morell. She is going to talk about first food justice. Uh, Erica holds a PhD uh, in, in public policy and sociology from the University of Michigan. She's currently a C3 Mellon, and I'll have to get an explanation for that, postdoctoral fellow at Middlebury College, where she teaches and conducts research on food and environmental justice. Her current book project, titled First Food Justice, explores infant feeding inequities in America and efforts to combat them. And we ask Dr. Morell to share some of that with us. All right, it's so wonderful to be here, but I wasn't as savvy as Dr. Taylor, so I didn't know I was going to get a title. So I have a different title, but it's the same substance, I promise. Um, so today I want to really talk about, so I'm a sociologist, I also do public policy, and so I wanted to talk about kind of why breastfeeding matters more broadly as a social, um, environmental, and economic issue. So I want to start by talking about how breastfeeding affects society, the economy, and the environment. And then I want to talk a little bit about how the society, the economy, and the environment affects breastfeeding. And then I want to get into justice and equity explicitly. So I'm going to do all of that in hopefully half an hour. Um, I, I do want to start by saying that I self-identify as white. I'm going to be talking about justice issues. I also identify with several other dominant groups. I'm heterosexual, for example. So I understand that I come to my project with a lot of privilege, and I'm happy to discuss how I address that privilege throughout my research and also the outputs from my research. But I'll spare you those details at this moment. Um, but I will also mention that I'm first generation, and my mother is refugee, and that's something that informs some of my work. So I am a qualitative sociologist, but I'm going to try to work in numbers a little bit today to really hit home this, this information. But I will happily talk about any of my qualitative research. And let's see if I can get through. To, OK. So let me start by talking a little bit about why breastfeeding is kind of a societal issue. And actually, this builds really wonderfully on Senator's talk earlier this morning. And she mentioned how um, breastfeeding is kind of like a national security issue in many ways. And so I'm going to touch a little bit on that. But to start in the most basic, uh, we were all infants once. So we all consumed one first food or another, right? At least breast milk or formula or maybe a combination of both or something like that. So in the sense of all of us being consumers of first foods, this is an issue that affects us all, both as individuals and as a society. And then we know that around 80 to 90% of adults in this country become parents. So this is a, a, an issue that affects almost every adult in our country because they become providers of first foods in some form or another, or, or they are responsible um, for caregiving in another form. And then also around 4 million babies are born in the US every year. So literally at any moment, there are millions of people in our society that are directly involved in consuming um, or providing first food. So just in the mere kind of involvement, we can see that much of society has some involvement in um, issues around breastfeeding um, and infant feeding in general. I'm going to spare you the details on the health benefits of breastfeeding, because I think that has been well covered in the last two days. But because of the health benefits that we know that breastfeeding and breast milk can confer to infants, in the US, um, infant mortality is reduced by 21% uh, for those who breastfed when compared with those who formula feed. So hopefully, I'm going to give you a lot of talking points today about what to take to policymakers about why this is a societal issue. So post-neonatal infant mortality refers to between 28 days and one year of life. And we know that it's likely a higher number if we also are able to factor in the first 28 days of life more accurately into our statistics. And I think, like, just from the social perspective here, we can all, I think, say that as individuals, we would have liked to develop the best biophysical qualities possible from birth ourselves. As parents, we want that for our children. And as a society, we kind of value that as a society, reducing infant mortality and infant health. So this is a societal issue just in the sense of general health and well-being. 
But as was mentioned a little bit this morning, this is also kind of an issue for national legitimacy, our competitiveness on the world stage, and our ability to retain workers. Um, so we have an infant mortality rate in this country that's almost six um, per 1,000 live, six deaths, excuse me, per 1,000 live births. And we know that some of that is connected to breastfeeding. So as I mentioned, the 21% reduction in deaths um, for babies who are breastfed. There are 56 countries, that means, in the world where your baby is more likely to survive infancy than here in the United States. And that really affects us when we try to argue that we have these advanced medical technologies and these high standards and values for our infants and um, our children as they grow up. So that includes almost pretty much every developed country in the world. It also includes you know, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Chechnya, um, Taiwan, Monaco, Hungary. So we're really, if we want to con con claim this legitimacy argument and this high standards argument, we're, we're not looking so great sometimes when we talk about infant mortality. And as I mentioned, this ties into our ability to keep workers, right, as was mentioned this morning, and also to attract potential workers to our workforce. So that that's going to take us into kind of the economic um, aspects of breastfeeding. So as I just suggested, breastfeeding can impact our workforce in terms of who we attract to our country to work and also retaining our own workers. I personally know and I've interviewed a lot of mothers and families that have considered moving away simply because of our maternity and paternity leave policies in this country and also breastfeeding policies and support in this country. And um, I know several who actually have, in fact, moved to Canada and also parts of Western Europe because of that. So that in, that's one way. Another way is simply infant health, right? Our infants are going to grow up to be our next generation of workers. So if they have higher rates of obesity, if they have higher rates of type 1 and 2 diabetes and other health illnesses, they're going to be less health, healthy on the job, and that's going to affect our future workforce. We also know that breastfeeding has benefits for the mother, um, both immediately post-delivery. It can help with recovering from childbirth, and it can also affect her health for several years to come in terms of also um, obesity and, and cancers later in life. So for her health on the job, it's also an important issue for us all. Mothers will return to work healthier and more quickly um, if, she, if she breastfeeds. Um, but also, the healthier the infant and the healthier the mother, the less likely days of work will be missed, right? So somebody has to care for that sick child if they're not as well as a breastfed baby, and the mother herself may not be able to return to work if she's having problems that breastfeeding may have helped. So there was one study <clears throat> somewhat recently that compared 1,000 breastfed babies and 1,000 never breastfed babies um, in the th first three months of life and compared the um, hospital visits just for three common diseases, um, the upper uh, a lo excuse me, lower respiratory tract illness, otitis media, which someone else can probably pronounce better than a sociologist, sorry, but that's an ear infection, and I can say that and gastrointestinal illness. So these are just three common diseases that we know have a reduced incidence in breastfed babies. And you can see here that there was quite a, a rise in office visits and also hospitalizations for those who were never breastfed. So somebody has to get the infant right to the hospital or to a doctor, and that's usually a parent or caregiver who may be working elsewhere if they didn't have to do this. So. Around, again, as I said, around 80 to 90 percent of adults in this country will become parents. So this is an issue for almost everybody in this country. But even if you yourself aren't a parent, it's likely that you have coworkers and members of your team who may be, and they're going to be less reliable at the workplace um, with these kind of demands, healthcare demands for their children. And they're also going to probably be less productive at home if they have other kids to take care of, or if they're supporting a spouse or other family members in the workplace. But um, moving beyond the workplace, I'd also like to touch on healthcare a little bit. We have some studies that also suggest that the cost of caring for sick infants because of not breastfeeding are significantly higher in this country than they would be if we met some of our targets. So if 90% of US families breastfed, um, the recommended six months, um, exclusive breastfeeding of six months, 
and then complementary feeding there forward, we would approximately save $13 billion annually as a society and reduce direct and indirect healthcare costs. And this is just for infants. So this is the cost of caring for the sick infant and just in the first year of life. This is not factoring in the potential of childhood obesity later in life. This isn't factoring in potential healthcare costs associated with the mother. So this is just in the infant health alone. So that's a substantial savings. Um, the study was published in 2010 in Pediatrics, the journal Pediatrics, but it's based on $2,007. And that number is still quite high for 80%. So if we could meet the target for 80% exclusively breastfeeding for the six months of life, the cost savings would be approximately $10.5 billion annually um, to society. So that's something we would all as a society in our shared healthcare system um, save if, if breastfeeding rates increased. And I think it's been mentioned several times at this conference that we are already initiating about at a rate of 80%. So this isn't about convincing individual mothers to try to breastfeed. And we know that most mothers can and want and have the physical ability to breastfeed as do their kids. There's always exceptions, but we know that most can. So this is really, a, in many cases, just a duration issue, which I'm going to argue later, is also um, constructed by the society and the environment we live in. Because of time, I'm going to skip over this, but this is another three common diseases. You can see just for each disease kind of the cost breakdown. Just want to show you. Um, so this means, and I'll make the slides available later if they're not already. This is the increased likelihood if they're not breastfed. So you're three times as likely to get the stomach flu um, if you're not breastfed. And so that's the societal cost. NEC is necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a disease that affects the lower bowels. I think, I think I have that right, and it's especially in low birth weight infants, <laughs> or there's the bowels, um, especially affects low birth weight infants, and it's much um, higher incidence in non-breastfed babies. So these are just some of the statistics just to get, give you a better sense kind of per case of illness. And there's also infant mortality associated with this. So if 90% of, of US families met um, the markers for breastfeeding, the, the recommended markers for breastfeeding, breastfeeding, not only would it save $13 billion annually, it would save one to 2,000 infant lives annually. Um, OK, so I also, in terms of the economy, wanted to briefly mention WIC, which builds on the conversation earlier. So we know formula costs a lot of money out of pocket for families. It costs, there's a variety of estimates, um, some estimates around 900 a month for an exclusively formula-fed baby. Some say that's a little too high. Um, but a mom needs to eat around three to 500 calories more per day, whereas formula costs about an ounce is a dollar per day. And most babies eat around 24 ounces per day. So that's $24 a day. So it's substantially higher than a mother who may have a piece of toast with peanut butter. It comes around to 80 cents and falls within that caloric range, right? So it's going to be a lot more to feed formula. And some babies eat as much as. 32 ounces a day, which would be $32 a day. But in terms of society's cost, WIC is a fully federally funded program that provides formula to families um, at no cost, usually. And that is reduced significantly because WIC is such a large purchaser of formula, they're able to negotiate the price down. So they don't play, pay a dollar per ounce. However, because they're such a large pur purchaser, they still buy such quantities, it costs society about a billion dollars a year. To, to have WIC supply formula. So if breastfeeding rates increased, ostensibly, you know, society's taxpayer dollars would be not going so much to the WIC formula program. Of course, it's also important to note that WIC does provide an enhanced food package to nursing mothers. The assumption here, though, is that nursing mothers will therefore be eating healthier and be healthier because they're nursing. So they'll have those workplace and healthcare um, net economic benefits. So again, even on WIC, there's going to be a net social benefit in terms of the cost savings to society if a mom nurses over feeding infant formula. That makes sense. And then another area that we sometimes skip over, I feel like, but is important to me as an environmental justice scholar, is really this aspect of the environmental burdens of formula consumption and the benefits of breastfeeding. Um, 
both in terms of pollution, waste, and infrastructure, and also natural disasters. So in terms of pollution, waste, and infrastructure, formula requires processing, packaging, shipment, and storage before it reaches consumers. And then post-consumption, it results in a lot of waste. So for about every million babies that consumes formula, about 150 million containers of formula are also consumed. And about 2.4 million babies are eating formula in this country by three months of age. So every day we're going through millions, uh, theoretically, um, depending on how many babies at any given time are on formula throughout the lifespan of zero months to a year, but we're going through millions of containers of formula daily. And that's putting wear and tear on our roads. It's processing. It's using soy or milk from dairy and livestock and farming. Um, it's in terms of waste. It's often filled, filling up our landfills. It's intensive on our roads and infrastructure because of all the shipping and trucking that has to go on, both to get it to the consumer and then to pick it up from the consumer and bring it to a disposal facility. And let's also think a little bit about natural disasters, or really any disaster situation, but especially natural disasters. So for example, when Hurricane Katrina hit, and I teach college students, they don't even remember Hurricane Katrina, but I think most of us still, and they don't remember 9-11, you know, but I think most of us remember that that was a big deal. And most formula-fed babies lost access to their food supply during that, because there was such great food food shortages there. So there was an issue of hunger and malnutrition when um, Hurricane Katrina hit. Then formula was actually one of the first shipments that came in of aid and donations to the area. But then there was also the risk of, um, of mixing that formula with the potentially contaminated water supply, right? And something I didn't even mention when I was talking about the environmental burdens of formula is the use of bottles and the need to use additional resources to sterilize them to warm them, and of course, to produce them in the first place. And certainly, some mothers who express milk will also need bottles, but there's a greater demand for the formula feeding mother because, or family member or caregiver because they'll need to use it every single time. So that was an issue um, when Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina hit. Not only the loss of a food supply, then a potentially contaminated food supply, but also all the equipment needed to make sure that food supply continued and then kind of a cycle of dependency. We also saw this more recently during the Flint water crisis. However, there, there's the added risk that for potentially months or years, formula had been mixed with a highly lead-contaminated water supply. And now these babies were, were forced to continue eating formula because their mothers were incapable of relactating for the time period they had stopped um, at that point. There was also concerns about the safety of her breast milk, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but I, oh, sorry, I wanted to say one more thing. So you can see up here that in disaster situations, non-breastfed infants are up to 20 times more likely to die than any other group. And that's partly for the hunger issue, the loss of food, and it's more so tied to improper um, water supplies. And so infants will develop diarrhea and potentially die from that. About 15% of infants die from diarrhea, and, and that's higher in disaster situations. Um, and this is an international issue in terms of where we send our aid, right? So we often send formula aid overseas, um, and then we're sending it to areas that probably in many situations lack proper water supplies. And then we create illnesses in these refugee camps and in things like that, that now is an added demand on our global healthcare systems, right? So we're creating this cycle. And for the refugees and immigrants who end up coming to the United States, they often want to continue using formula after being exposed to it in a refugee camp. They either think it's better because they were encouraged to use it, or they're now forced to use it because they weren't counseled on how to keep their supply up during the disaster and now have lost their milk supply. And so they use formula when they come here. So I currently live in Burlington, Vermont which may surprise you, we have a very large refugee population. We're a refugee resettlement community. And we noticed marked differences between the Nepalese uh, refugees, excuse me, who didn't have as much formula in their camps. They tend to breastfeed a lot higher rates than Somalis who did have formula exposure. And those both groups are going to WIC. So one group is going to WIC, not just for food for the older people in their family, but also for formula, whereas the one who wasn't exposed to formula in the refugee camp tends to not request that as much. 
Okay, so what's really especially interesting now is not to only talk about kind of these three areas that breastfeeding can potentially affect, but how we all affect breastfeeding, right? Because that's where there's the potential for real interventions. I mean, we want to help with individual um, issues that constrain and enable breastfeeding success as much as we can. But as a society, we, of course, have a little bit more control potentially over the social kind of construction of breastfeeding and formula feeding in this country. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, these kind of broader societal influencers. And of course, there's many. But I will start with public opinion. This statistic is dated. So this statistic is from a study in 2001 that said about 60% of the American public didn't believe a woman should have the right to breastfeed in public. And that's in part why we have all these wonderful laws coming up to protect a woman's right. I mean, as someone said earlier, it's sad that we need those laws, but there was a recognition that this was a problem, and there have been efforts to address it. So my hope and guess is the statistics gone down a little since that study. Um, but we still read consistent reports of women being asked to leave, you know, malls, public places of worship, um, pu any public space, really, buses, um, grocery stores, restaurants, and all those things. And it's not necessarily even the mother hearing that herself. It's the general understanding that in this country, there's some questions or some potential that there's not going to be an acceptance if you're feeding in public, right? It's just the knowledge that you could be shamed that can dissuade a mother from breastfeeding. It's not even if she actually experiences that herself. It's just knowing that that is kind of the culture here. Because that raises questions for a lot of mothers. Well, why do people shame it in pu public? Maybe I don't want to nurse in public. And you know what? Maybe why then would I nurse at home? Maybe I just won't nurse at all. It creates questions for her family. And that can really um, impede on breastfeeding success that we know from some of the studies. Um, so not only, though, does it have this kind of symbolic effect, but it kind of manifests um, in, in how we support pumping and nursing and breastfeeding throughout other public spaces in concrete support. So happily, um, as a discussion earlier this morning was saying, breastfeeding, places that support breastfeeding and pumping in airports is increasing already, even without that legislation that's wonderfully being promoted right now. So that's a great thing. Sadly, um, I think a lot of hospitals still have some ways to go. So we in this country have around 437 hospitals have achieved baby-friendly status. But that means only about 21% of births in the United States occur in a hospital that's baby-friendly. And we know the environment where a baby is born really affects what that baby is fed. Um, so there's a lot of studies that show the benefits of, of um, being born in a breastfeeding friendly environment and specifically a baby friendly hospital on the likelihood that a baby will not only initiate breastfeeding but also continue um, and meet some of those duration markers at three and six months. So this is another area that kind of ties into both public and the health care. And I want to move on now, and I'm going to come back to some of this, but I want to move on a little bit to workplaces. I think we talked about this, I wasn't here yesterday, but I think this statistic was mentioned that around 25% of US moms return to work within two weeks of giving birth. So if, which surprises me every time I see you shaking your head. It shocks me every time I hear this. I mean, it kind of shocks me, right? I, I believe it, but it's unbelievable. So it takes a few days for breast milk to come in and a few days to establish a supply. I mean, more than a few days. So for these mothers, really, I don't want to, set them up for failure, but they are, it's biologically almost impossible for her to be successful in breastfeeding, no matter how much she wants to, um, because it's just her supply isn't even going to be regularly, you know, she's not even going to have her supply kind of figured out in a relationship with her baby um, when she's going back to work. And not only that, but we know that, unfortunately, many employers still don't support breastfeeding. So we have some good laws in this country now. We're starting to make progress, but there's a lot of exceptions to those laws. So some of our laws that protect maternity leave and protect pumping in the workplace have exemptions for workplaces that have less than 50 employees, for part-time workers, and things like that. So a lot of um, employers still don't have policies. And even if they do, the employer themselves or their colleagues, coworkers, may have attitudes that can dissuade women from wanting to pump at work, you know, create hostile work environments. And that kind of ties into our public perceptions of breastfeeding. So if we thought breastfeeding was healthy and normal and 
in more greater numbers in this country, it's likely that would kind of go into the workplace. So what I'm suggesting here is that where we live and work impacts how we eat and feed. Okay, so we know this from the research on older adults and children, first uh, food deserts, excuse me, many of you are probably familiar with. So this idea that we had this rise in obesity, and some people wanted to blame that on individual behaviors alone and say, oh, poor choices of what to eat, or that person's not exercising. But the food desert comment, uh, concept helped bring to life the fact that some people don't have access to healthier food, right? If you don't even have a grocery store that has healthy food, how are you supposed to make healthy choices? If you don't have safe places to exercise or have recreation, where are these kids going to run around? So this idea of food deserts, these areas that constrain and, and enable whether you make decisions that will affect your overall health is true not only for older adults, but we're learning more and more that it's true for infants as well. And so first food deserts is meant to capture this reality. And these deserts connote areas that have disproportionate opportunities, risks, resources, and community sentiments, which contribute to low breastfeeding rates. rates. So places with low breastfeeding rates such as Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, and New Orleans, Louisiana, also have the same first food desert characteristics. They have no baby-friendly hospital within a 35-minute commute. Minute commute, excuse me. 50% um, or more of employers have no breastfeeding policy or places to nurse and express milk. 30% of childcare facilities are untrained to handle express milk. So even if the mother wanted to use her expressed milk and she returns to work, if her only childcare option is a facility that doesn't handle it, she's required to use formula. 50% um, of the public feel uncomfortable when seeing a uh, report, excuse me, feeling uncomfortable when seeing a woman breastfeed. And there's a consistent lack of culturally relevant healthcare support, peer support, and uh, public spaces to support breastfeeding. So as a sociologist, I wouldn't say it's a mere coincidence that low breastfeeding rates and these characteristics happen to occur in the same areas. I would say there's probably not just a correlation here, but a causation, and the research is starting to emerge that, that confirms that. And I'm going to talk a little bit this, about this more when I talk about justice in just a minute. But I finally just wanted to talk a little bit about how our environment shapes breast milk quality and access. So I mentioned a little bit earlier when I talked about Flint, this idea of lead contamination and questions about breast milk quality. So we know that pollution builds up in pre, uh, pre, pre excuse me, in uh, maternal bodies prior to becoming pregnant. Then when they become pregnant and then post-delivery, that those toxins bioaccumulate in breast milk and get passed on to the infant through the breast milk. So we have found, studies are now showing that toxins, including BPA or bisphenol A, which is that plastic component that so many people now advertise are not in their plastics because it's so dangerous. We have studies confirming that in most maternal breast milk. Um, perfluorinated chemicals, PFCs, which are used in floor cleaners and nonstick pans, chloroform, which is a refrigerant, benzene, which is in cigarette smoke and gasoline, and several heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, and mercury. These all accumulate in breast milk. But currently, fortunately, studies suggest that in most humans, the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh the negatives of this bioaccumulation because still it's, it's small enough amounts that it's much healthier to breastfeed than the, any negatives from this contamination. Um, but it's certainly a concern to think about going forward as we continue to pollute our environment. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this a little more in terms of justice. So let me, let me move into this last part of my talk, which is why breastfeeding is not only a social, economic, and environmental issue in the society economy and environment impact breastfeeding, but why this is an issue about justice. And I unfortunately missed a talk on equity yesterday, but hopefully some of this was mentioned. Um, but by justice, I refer to the notion that opportunities, obstacles, burdens, and risks of something are shared equally, regardless of someone's race or socioeconomic status, education, or a variety of other identifiers. So injustice and when those burdens aren't shared equally. And currently in this country, we have a lot of injustice when it comes to breastfeeding. Um, so I'm going to talk about this today a little bit in terms of black and white racial groups specifically. I'm happy to discuss it in terms of class, 
Um, or I also do a lot of work with American Indian populations, but mostly on the Navajo Nation. So I, I don't want to generalize to all groups. But so I'll start with um, differences between white and black racial groups, and then we can always talk about other things in the Q&A, but just for the interest of time. So we know that black breastfeeding initiation and duration are still several percentage points behind whites, including around 16 to 17 percentage points, depending on um, the time of, of breastfeeding, whether it's initiation or duration. In part because of this, black babies are 2.2 times as likely to die in the United States um, in their first year of life than their white counterparts. And I say in part because of this, because we know that they're 3.5 times as likely to die um, of low birth weight, which we have a lot of studies that really closely link that to breastfeeding or not, or access to breast milk, I should say. So these rates are staggering. I think the national average for white groups, infant mortality is 5.1 deaths per 1,000 live births. For black babies, it's going to be over 11 deaths per 1,000 live births. And in some communities, I did some work in Detroit, for example. I've done some work in the projects in Richmond, Virginia. Um, the numbers are much higher. So this is like aggregated. This data is aggregated over the entire country. But if you live in Detroit, you have your baby, if it's black, regardless of income or education, I'll add that. So this is not an income or education. It's just a racial disparity. Um, rivals many of some of the world's worst countries in terms of infant mortality. So there, there can be over 20 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. So why is this? Sociologists, including myself, would argue this is not just because as a, you know, tons of individual moms that are black are choosing not to breastfeed, there's got to be social issues here as societal issues. We know a lot about trauma, historical trauma, and things like that. But I want to also start with messaging. So there's a lot of messaging which disproportionately negatively discusses breastfeeding with regards to the black community including overemphasizing issues such as the pain of breastfeeding and the potential for an inadequate milk supply. I love Kimberly Seals Allers, who some of you are probably familiar with her work, says, you know, lactation is the only bodily function we ever question. I mean, why do we, we don't question if our heart is going to beat tomorrow. We don't question if our sperm's going to ejaculate from our penis, but we can't be sure that our breast milk's going to come in, right? And there's that messaging that's coming, it's hitting one group more than others. But I also want to talk about messaging in terms of what I did today. So there's also a problem among some of us, and myself included, to present statistics without context, which re-victimizes black mothers. So by saying there's 16 percentage points behind white groups makes them sound inadequate, incapable, or some problem with them, right? If we give context, which I'd like to do in just a minute, we see that actually those rates are extraordinary because black groups face a lot greater challenges than white groups, and yet they're still achieving these amazing numbers. So there's kind of a messaging problem. We could also talk to black women about, you know, in the 50s, the rates were this, and it's increased so much, and you can do it, instead of, well, you know, among black communities, it's really far behind, so I hope you can do it and help, help keep those numbers up because we really need to close the gap. You know, there's a, there's a messaging issue here that I think we can all try to work on. Um, and that's based on what black mothers have told me. I didn't invent that myself. I, was, I wish I could say that I was that smart. So this kind of ties into culturally relevant support. So part of the reason is a lot of messaging is not coming from people who understand some of the cultural issues in some of these communities, right? We still have a lot of differences in culturally relevant support, um, both from medical providers as well as peer support. So La Leche League is still by far the most common peer support group in this country. Many of you probably know it was founded by white middle class women of religious background. And it's, it's certainly tried to shed some of that legacy, but it's hard to completely shed that legacy. For a long time, they wouldn't allow people to come into the group who were working moms, whether they were white or black. Um, and there's just some general stigma about the La Leche League and some people's head about being kind of this white and elite group. And so some mothers are hesitant to go to them for peer support. And there are amazing groups led by black women all over the country, just not under one umbrella like La Leche League. But there's the Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association. There's plenty of wonderful websites. And so there's great efforts. They're just not as out there um, as they could be. And I think as, as we could try to get out there if, if we ourselves aren't culturally relevant to let women know what, what options there are for her. And there's also significant research. I tried to find breastfeeding specific research, but there's not 
too much out there, but we know from other medical research that whether intentionally or not, and often it's unintentional, there are racial differences in how white providers provide support to their patients, whether they're black or white. So this is not just, oh, moms want culturally relevant support, which is important, but we have statistics that demonstrate that public health, medical care, and human service providers tend to discuss and treat issues around pain, issues around diagnosis, and issues around um, kind of the outcome of both the patient and their, their family dynamic differently between white and black racial groups. And it tends to be um, issues around pain and, and things are overemphasized among black groups and positive diagnoses for outcomes are underestimated under black groups. So you're, you're more likely to hear, you may need to use formula, your baby's underweight if you're black than if you're white. So here's a national study that kind of touches on this in terms of um, maternity care practices at US birthing facilities. So in zip codes where the percentage of black residents is greater than 12.2%, which is the average percentage of black residents in the United States, um, the important maternity care practices to support breastfeeding were systematically lower than in areas that were predominantly or had greater percentages of white residents. So this data suggests some key things. Um, some of the most remarkable statistics to me are, are the top. So early initiation of breastfeeding is markedly different. And this doesn't matter if it's baby friendly or not. This is just by zip code. Um, we see limited use of breastfeeding supplements also markedly different between predominantly white areas or those with greater black racial groups. So we have systematic differences still in healthcare provision. And the reason I mention this specifically, partly because this is a physician's association, um, but also because there was a study, and there's actually a couple different studies, but one um, that I looked at in the Journal on Human Lactation, there's actually about five or six, and I'm happy to provide all those references, um, that suggests that for baby-friendly hospitals, the disparity in breastfeeding initiation and duration at six months, the racial disparity between black and white racial groups is almost completely gone just from having greater care in the, in the hospital. So um, there was a study done in the inner city hospital in Boston that looked at um, data of all infants born, regardless of what, how they came in. Some were lower income, some were black, some were white. Some, of course, cross those identities. And all of them kind of had the comparable numbers um, for both initiation and duration at six months when they were born in a baby-friendly hospital. So there's research that suggests with adequate healthcare providers' support that regardless of your race, you can have the same outcomes in your breastfeeding. And then I want to go back to the first food desert. So the areas that I mentioned, Birmingham, Jackson, and, uh, Jackson, and New Orleans, all are predominantly black and all have low breastfeeding rates and all are first food deserts. So when I say where you live and work impacts how you eat and feed, that's particularly true if you're black. Um, and so those things certainly need to be addressed when we're talking about black and white racial groups. We also know that many black women um, on average return to work sooner than white women and they on average have less breastfeeding support at their workplaces and part of that is because on average they tend to work um, maybe more jobs that are putting together hours so they don't have full time at one employer so they don't qualify for certain health care um, provisions or because they work in places that have 50 or, uh, 50 or less employees, so they're exempt from those provisions that protect workplaces. And then finally, consider the environment. So both natural disasters I mentioned earlier, Hurricane Katrina and also the Flint water crisis, were in places that were predominantly black, and or, excuse me, well, Flint is predominantly black, but also in the, it was the black population that was predominantly affected. So we have disproportionate impacts from natural disasters among communities of color, typically in this country. We also have a significant amount of research that suggests that toxic waste facilities and heavily polluting industries in this country are systematically located in places that are lower income and places that are communities of color. So there's more exposure in terms of bioaccumulation and breast milk for women of color. And I said I was gonna stick to black and white racial groups, but I really wanted to mention this one statistic that's just remarkable to me as well. Um, in some Inuit populations, PCB and mercury levels were um, 50 times higher 
than women in some of North America's biggest cities. So in some of these communities, it actually already is more dangerous to breastfeed your children than it is to feed them formula because the mercury levels are so high and the PCB levels are so high. And that's because they rely on seafood that's high up on the food chain. So they're, they're contributing least to pollution in our world, but they're experiencing firsthand the burdens of this toxic contamination. So that's environmental justice in definition, right? The, the ones who are contributing least are being impacted worst. Um, I'm gonna conclude for in a minute, um, but the last thing I wanted to mention, I added this slide, because this morning someone was talking about what can we do to make a difference, and we were talking about strange legislation that you wouldn't think to care about if you're interested in breastfeeding. So here's one. Um, HR 482 was introduced in um, January. Uh, it hasn't fully moved forward yet, but it's under consideration. And as an environmental and food justice researcher, this really impacts me, and I hadn't even thought to bring it up until someone asked that question this morning, so I scrambled and added this slide. It's going to, if it passes, it will not allow us to do research that would help us do exactly first food desert research, looking at geographic areas by race and disparity. So it would limit our access to federal data that could give us geospatial information on community racial disparities and access to affordable housing. So this is actually with, H, um, with HUD, I think, um, but it affects, it affects a lot of people doing environmental justice research. So a lot of first food desert um, research looks at um, geospatial information to understand where people by racial group live. And so if we can't access the data, we have no way to know if where you live impacts what you eat and feed because we won't have access to that data anymore. So this is the kind of stuff, even I myself hadn't thought breastfeeding should care about this, but if this data goes away, any more research on this topic will be much harder to do. Um, so there's just another place that we can, we can make a difference. I have no idea how long I talked, but I'll stop. And I thank you so much. <laughs> Hopefully I've answered. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Canvasser with the Necrotized and Intercolitis Society. Um, my question has to do with the WHO code marketing of breast milk substitutes. So given what we know about first food deserts and food deserts, um, what efforts is being done in the U.S., whether it's legislation or, uh, you know, through other efforts to implement the WHO code uh, marketing of breast milk substitutes? That way in first food deserts, uh, perhaps we can begin to make some progress. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not an expert, but I will say that from my understanding, the U.S. has refused to sign on to the WHO code. Um, so the efforts are disparate depending on where you are. Um, the major one would be baby-friendly hospitals. Um, not promoting that, and that would probably be the largest. Um, because a lot of the grassroots kind of efforts that are phenomenal, they don't have control over these kind of systemic problems. So where they try to intervene in first food deserts are like peer support groups and encouraging women in other ways, but they don't have access to the hospital, which is the major place for formula marketing. Hi, my name is Jennifer Pratt-Miles. I'm a senior mediator with the Meridian Institute, and that's an organization that works with groups to design and facilitate and implement collaborative processes. And my question is, do you know who the co-sponsors are on HR 482? I can get it for you because it's on my laptop because I was cut and pasting it, but I don't know. But I promise I will get it to you as soon as my talk's over, if Great, that works. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Beth Saley. I'm a practicing pediatrician in the first food desert, Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama. And I, I just have a comment, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I think sometimes we look at these large overarching issues and it seems so overwhelming. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done to overcome some of those barriers. I, my practice, Dr. Cooper, my OB partner, is had to leave a little bit early, but um, our practice is in the inner city, uh, predominantly African-American um, area, low income as well. So a lot of the uh, target populations. And so, you know, you just have to start somewhere. And one of the first things that we targeted was just having a support group 
in the community. Mm -hmm. All the all the support groups in our community were what they call over the mountain, which is the predominantly, you know, upper income areas of the city. So we went to a local predominantly African American church and partnered with them to plant a support group there that meets once a week. Then we recruited our mothers that were from minority groups that had successfully breastfed to come yeah. be, you know, part of the peer to peer support group in that area. And I think sometimes the most important thing we do is just help a mother from that group be successful. She goes back in, out into the community, and suddenly all the people around her have a role model mm. of somebody that looks like them who's successful. And um, that is probably the most important thing we can do. So I think yeah. that's wonderful. If I could just add on that, um, I know the Kellogg Foundation is supporting this conference, and they actually just funded the 3CFI initiative, the um, First Food Friendly Community Initiative that piloted, I think, in Philadelphia and in Detroit. And I did some research in Detroit. That's how I became familiar with this topic in general several years ago. So they just concluded their pilot. And that what they did was recruited women from the community, paid them. It's important that there's actual payment, that their expertise as as women with lived knowledge because of their race and place-based experiences are compensated just as those of us who have credentialed knowledge, formally credentialed knowledge, are compensated. So they paid those women, did the two-week or three-week training, I think, for leading something like that and had great outcomes both for the people who attended the groups but for the women who led them, who felt really empowered by that and, and felt like they could make difference for a long time just with a two- to three-week course. Um, and I would also say for communities that don't have the on-the-ground support available, there's so many great social media um, um, groups now that can really support women. Black women do breastfeed. I've had a lot of interviewees who express that that's a really important community of support for them if they don't have one in their immediate community. They can go on, and they have limited time or resources. They go online, post a question. They have a 1,000 responses you know, in an hour, and they're just kind of mining their community for knowledge, rebuilding their networks in a lot of different ways. So those can also be supported. Yeah. I promise mine will be a quick <laughs> comment. I'm Bolaji from Uide. I'm a neonatologist in Jackson, Mississippi, oh, another great. first food desert. And I'm just thinking we focus a lot on disparity and focus on racial disparity, which exists, which is real, which we see. But why don't we think outside of the box and think about income disparity? There are people who are still extremely sensitive to the idea of race, and they shut down once you talk about mm -hmm. race and the disparity related to that. Why don't we start talking about income disparity and the differences in breastfeeding that we see with that? Working in Jackson, Mississippi, we see that all the time. It's not mm -hmm. just black women who have those problems. Mm -hmm. They're low-income Caucasian women who are dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe all of us need to start you know, pushing that and talking that way so that we can get on board those who are averse to the issue of race. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. I also think in this current political climate, we saw that an issue in the last elections, just rural versus urban. It tends to be white groups who are more rural, and they are in food deserts. But they're not. we often talk about food deserts in terms of urban areas, and the same is true of first food deserts. So there's a lot of this issue between white I mean, excuse me, between rural and urban when we get into income as well. I think that's a great point, and I'm sorry that I played into the problem by talking about racial groups today. But I agree with you, absolutely. Michael Young, neonatologist here in Washington, D.C. My, my question is, in disasters, um, we keep bringing up that those um, workers that address them have not been well-trained in breastfeeding, breastfeeding education, breastfeeding support. Where do you think we could do that process? I mean, those they come from different agencies to do the 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 rescue work, but mm -hmm. how how would we get at mm -hmm. providing that education so that they would know? Yeah. So a year and a half ago, I forget her last name, Brooke. Some of you may know her. Started what's her last name? McBower, she started an organization that's doing some of this work, and it's phenomenal. And I can um, put that on my notes. That is trying to address this. So she's going to different refugee camps. But that's also a challenge. I think the biggest way would to be bring you know, the who and the marketing of formula type standards to aid groups. So to USAID, 
to um, uh, groups at the United Nations that are responsible for disaster response, to FEMA, you know, to get more collaboration on this issue. I don't think FEMA necessarily knows that this is an issue. I don't think it's an intentional overlook. It just, we tend to segregate our responses, right? And so we need to cross cut across these issues. Um, so yeah, I think it would be going to the primary organizations that are setting the standards for disaster response in a given area. So the United States, that would probably be FEMA. Uh, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true too. And also, um, wet nursing is still stigmatized in a lot of areas. Um, but unfortunately, in areas that where there are babies who need to have breast milk, there's probably a mom who lost her baby, right? And so there's a potential here, or a mom who's capable of nursing multiple babies. So there's also a potential there if we can kind of reduce the stigma around um, kind of shared breastfeeding. Jerry Fitzgerald, I just wanted to comment about disaster response in the US. I spent five years working on this, various agencies, and with the um, National Commission on Children and Disasters. It's very complicated. It's not simple, and it's very difficult to get people to listen to issues about breastfeeding when they're thinking about extracting people from buildings. So they are listening. However, it's the office of the Secretary for, um, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. It's not FEMA. That's a mistake that all of us have been making because they they only supply housing. Mm. They don't they don't really deal with this kind of thing. They do, however, store formula, and they don't know what conditions they need to store it under. And there is another group that um, includes churches and NGOs that respond after disasters. A whole nother group. And there's probably a third group that is um, state-related. Mm -hmm. Each state has mm -hmm. their own disaster. So it's really hard to address this. Mm -hmm. um, you would need to have a commission or, or something yeah. to be able to in, get it to In change. Michigan, there was a, a commission around breastfeeding that was formed right after kind of the Flint water crisis came to light. It was, came to light for many years before it was actually dealt with, but when it really came to light. Um, and they produced a really good packet of information. And, and instead of having to, to do that during the disaster, to now have that packet and to give it out for the next disaster. So even, I think, just kind of consistent statements, like you're saying, to give to these different groups that are one involved. Pager. Yeah, exactly. And, and a one-pager. Yeah, uh-huh, exactly, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this your note? Oh, yeah. Can I make one last question, please? I was standing there <laughs> somewhat. I'm sorry if I didn't make myself. I just, um, you know, this justice issue is so important. I hope it's last because it's so important because it underlies all the changes to really, you know, now they're trying at 80%. How do we, you know, the justice issues are the cause of that drop, I think. But there's one issue I didn't hear you address that I'm concerned about, and that's babies fair access to their mother. Mm -hmm. It's not the milk, it's the baby with the mother, too. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's in danger in, in our culture, and I think we have to think about that, too. Yeah. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Is that. Are you speaking in terms of maternity leave from work, or rooming in at the hospital, or, or I'm talking, being taken away from, by services, or what are you Part of it's of? maternity leave, but part of it is the idea that as long as your baby's getting the breast milk pumped from a bottle, that mm. and, and not having, you know, with the mother. And there's health reasons uh, for that, but I think there are other psychological reasons we've touched on, you know, for that, too. And what's ha so kind of a a desert of mothering as opposed yeah. to a des as well as a desert of mother's milk. Yeah, and I think that's tied to the workplace, really. I think that we should have a mandatory three months of maternity leave in this country. I mean, that's the minimum to establish like a really good breastfeeding relationship and mothering relationship and fathering relationship. We have very little support, and I know this was talked about yesterday a little bit, and not every family is heterosexual and male and female and dad and mom, but for those families that are, we've kind of discredited the father's role in both supporting the nursing mother and just being around to bond with the baby and that, that role too. And that's an injustice as well to men and to families. So yeah, it's unfortunate. 
Yeah, my, my really good friend works for a company that I won't name. It's one of the largest <laughs> retail companies in the country, and they did a whole thing on trying to get three months unpaid. They were willing to take it unpaid. And the this current CEO is a woman, and they still weren't able to get it passed. It's just a large barrier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.